Okay, so we are going to look at muscle physiology today. So if you look at this little guy over here to the right, this shows muscles, but we're not talking about muscles today. We're talking about how they work. But to do that, we have to talk a little bit about their shape and organization and so on. But first, let's think about why we even have muscles. What do muscles do for us? Well, if you think about it, what muscles mostly do is movement. It's movement. Muscles are all about movement. And so when you talk about movement, that could be actual physical movement, but it could also be maintaining things like posture and position. Because in order to do that, muscles have to hold you upright. Muscles also support internal organs, so they keep our abdomen, the organs inside, from moving around and um, so on. And then we also have muscles around the entrances and exits to our body. So if you look at the mouth, for example, if we go back to this picture here, there's muscle all around the mouth. And so that's an entrance. Same thing is true for the urethra and same thing's true for the rectum. And so muscles guard the entrances and exits to our body. And then muscles are actually quite inefficient. They're only about 25 to 30 percent efficient. That means that 75 percent of the energy they use goes off as heat. And so when you contract a muscle, they produce a lot of heat. And so that heat helps us to maintain our body temperature. So those are the basic functions of the skeletal muscle system. Let's talk about some characteristics that skeletal muscles have. In fact, all muscles have these characteristics. One is that they're sort of like neurons. They're excitable or irritable. Remember that when we talked about neurons, we said they were irritable, and what that means is they can respond to a stimulus. Well, muscles also respond to stimuli. Well, when neurons get a stimulus, they produce an action potential, and it travels down their surface, and they release a neurotransmitter. When muscles get a stimulus, they're going to produce an action potential, and it's going to travel down their surface. But instead of releasing a neurotransmitter in response, they're going to contract. And so another characteristic is contractility. And contractility is the ability to shorten forcibly. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if they're attached to something and they shorten forcibly, they're going to move that object. Another thing about muscles is that you can stretch them and so that property is called extensibility. So you can stretch a muscle or extend a muscle. And because they are elastic, they, if you stop stretching them, they return to their original length. And so that's also a property, elasticity. So we have these four functional characteristics of muscle tissue, excitability or irritability, contractility, extensibility, and elasticity. And it doesn't matter which type of muscle you're talking about, they all have these same four characteristics. But today we're going to be looking at skeletal muscles. And so again, we're not going to be naming skeletal muscles like we do, but we still have to talk a little bit about what their anatomy is in order to understand the physiology. So when you look at a muscle, a muscle looks something like this. And look, when we look here, we see red. So we see red. Well, the red here, and you can see it in here, is muscle. But there's also white in here. And there's white in here as well. Well, that white is not muscle. That white is connective tissue. And so muscle isn't just there by itself. It has coverings of connective tissue. And we can see these coverings. Well, when you look at a whole muscle like this one, there's a covering that goes all the way around, almost like a sock or a sheath. And you can see it here. Because it's on top of the muscle, it's called the epimesium. And so that's what this is, the epimesium. So the epimesium is made out of dense, irregular connective tissue. It covers the entire outside of the muscle. 
And then when you get close to the end of the muscle, it actually turns into dense regular connective tissue and becomes a tendon. So this tendon, these fibers run this way. Remember, they're all parallel, but when you get up here, the fibers begin to run in all directions. And so it forms like a sock or a sheath around the whole muscle. We also, though, if you look inside the muscle, you see these little round circle-like things here. Well, it's actually a bundle of muscle. And if you blow one up, it looks like this. And the bundle of muscle that we're talking about is called a fascicle. The word fascicle means cord. So it's like a little cord of muscle inside there. And look how many there are. I can't count them, but there's a bunch of them in here. You can see many, many, many of them. Well, they also have connective tissue around them. And you can see it better in this picture here. So see the little white ring around each one of these red things. That white ring is this. And so it's also connective tissue. And that white ring around the fascicle is called the perimesium. So perimesium is also dense, irregular connective tissue. And what it does is it surrounds a group of muscle cells, muscle fibers. A, that, that group is called a fascicle. And so in this picture, this is our perimesium. And this is the fascicle. Well, if you look inside the fascicle, Look, even smaller little things are in here. And these smaller little things are actually the muscle cells. So that's one muscle cell right there. And that's another one. And that's another one. And again, I don't know how many are in here, but there's a bunch of them. But look, there's white rings around them too. And so there's connective tissue that separates all the individual muscle fibers from the ones around it. And so if you look at it, you can see it. This is that connective tissue. And if you blow that up, it looks like this. This is called the endomesium. The endomesium is very fine connective tissue. It's a realer connective tissue. And so it has these fibers in it and it surrounds each individual muscle cell. So when we look at these connective tissue coverings, again, there are three of these. There's an epimesium around the whole muscle, there's perimesium around the fascicles, and there's endomesium around the individual muscle fibers. So if you look at this, hopefully you can name these things. So look over this and see if you can figure out what each of these things are. So what do you think one is here? What is it referring to? So what is this thing? That's the tendon, exactly. And then here's this covering here. Number two, that's the what? Anybody know? That's the epimesium, exactly. And then if you look here, here's this bundle here. And this bundle is a fascicle, and you can see a bunch of them here. Here's another one and another one and another one. But look at the covering around the fascicle. What's the covering around the fascicle? It's the perimesium. And then inside here are the individual muscle fibers or muscle cells, and their covering is the endomesium. Make sense to everyone? Well, we're going to spend most of our time not talking about a whole muscle or a fascicle. We're going to spend most of our time talking about an individual muscle cell. And so if you look at an individual muscle cell, they're also called muscle fibers. They're long, long cells. And if you look at them, they're cylinder shaped. We already looked at this when we did histology. But remember, they're long enough so that they encompass the entire length of the muscle. So if the muscle is this long, 
then the muscle cells, muscle fibers are this long. Every single one of them is the length of the muscle. They're not very thick. Look, they're only 10, about 100 microns in diameter, but they can be hundreds of centimeters long. They're very long. Well, when you look at them, they look like this down here, but they didn't always look like that. They start out looking like this. So these are individual muscle cells called myoblasts. Myo refers to muscle. So anytime you see that, it's going to have something to do with muscle. And remember what blast means? Blast cells are what kind of cells? They're producing cells, remember? They're creating cells. And so what they're going to do is they're going to turn into this muscle fiber and the way they do it is, look, all these individual cells, they all have their own nucleus, they all have their own cytoplasm. But what happens is they fuse together. So this and this are going to connect right there. And the membrane between them is going to disappear. And so that cell is going to look like this one. And then what's going to happen is those even bigger cells are going to fuse together. And they're going to continue to fuse together, fuse together all along the length of this muscle fiber. So when we look at this, each one of these nuclei used to be the nucleus of one of these individual cells. So I don't know exactly how many cells this used to be, but we could kind of try to figure it out. But it's going to be hundreds of them because these things are so long. And so this is a cell up here. But when you put cells together and you create bigger cells, we no longer call them a cell anymore. They're not normal. Look, this has one nucleus cell. This has hundreds of nuclei. And it's a fusion of all of these myoblasts. And so now it's called a muscle fiber. So when you look at a muscle fiber, remember it's a fusion of hundreds of individual muscle cells, but here's a muscle fiber and here's another one and here's another one and here's another one. And you can see how long they are. But remember, this is a microscope slide. So this is going way off the other way and way off the other way because these are the same length as the individual muscle that they're part of. But when we look here, I can see all these. I can see eight individual muscle fibers. And then look at this white in here in between. That is that endomesium that we talked about. And so these muscle fibers don't actually come into contact with each other. They don't touch each other. There's this little sock of endomesium around every one of them, this little sheath. And so it looks like this. And so these cells cannot talk to each other. They don't touch each other. They're not in communication with each other. <clears throat> so they're isolated from each other. But again, that's what it's going to look like, basically, when it's finished. And then this one looks like these. Any questions about any of that? So if we were to just take a drawing of one of these muscle fibers, it would look like this. Now, obviously, it's only a little chunk because it goes way off this way and it goes way off this way. But then if we cut it open and look at it, what we see inside it are individual, even smaller little rod-like structures called myofibrils. And look how many myofibrils there are in this cell, in this muscle fiber. Now these are not cells. These are not alive. They're not cells. They're rod-like structures made out of proteins. And these proteins, when you look at them, they're in this long rod-like structure, and then they're just packed in here. They're just packed in here like sardines in a can. 
So when we look at this muscle fi fiber, this is what we see. We can see nuclei here. There's a nucleus. There's a nucleus. We can see a cell membrane right here. And they folded it back so you can see what it looks like. And then you can see all of these myofibrils in here. So let's talk about some of these structures. One of these structures is the membrane itself, the membrane. So if we go back and look at the picture, it's this part right here. And here they folded it back so you could see this membrane. Well, the membrane on a muscle fiber is very similar to the membrane on a neuron. Remember the membrane on the neuron? It's this layer, phospholipid, but it had these channels and it had pumps. So we had the sodium potassium pump. And remember the sodium potassium pump pumps three sodiums out and it brings two potassiums back in over and over and over again. And then we also had these leak channels. So remember we had sodium leak channels and we had potassium leak channels and these leak channels allow these ions to leak back in the down their gradient. And so if it is sodium, it's going to leak back in. If it's potassium, it's going to leak back out through these channels. This is nothing new. This is stuff we learned before, but the sodium is going to tend to come back in. The potassium is going to tend to go back out and we're going to get a resting potential. We're going to get that steady state. Well, this is exactly the same as in neurons. So Johannan says, isn't many cells forming the fiber? Yes, many, many cells form the fiber. And is it still right to call it a muscle cell? Most people don't call it a muscle cell. They call it a muscle fiber. I use them interchangeably. That just helps people to understand what, the, what it is. So just think of them as being the same thing. But it's a big cell, not, not a little bitty cell. It's a big, long cell. But again, back to this. So we have this sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma, very similar to the membrane of a neuron. And remember on the neuron, we said that if you stimulate it, we can get an action potential. We're going to open voltage-gated channels and we're going to get an action potential. That's exactly the same thing that happens here. So if you look at the sarcolemma, it looks like this. There's the sarcolemma right there. There is one big difference, though, between the muscle cell sarcolemma and the neuron sarcolemma. And that is, on a neuron, it's just flat like that. It covers the cell, but it's just flat. And it goes all the way around the cell, just like this. But that's not true of a muscle neuron, of sarcolemma. Because look what it does. It comes this way, and then right here... It folds in. It folds in like this. This is still membrane. It's like if you go outside and dig a hole in the ground. On those sides of the hole, it's still dirt. It's still ground. And that's exactly the way this is. And so it has all of these tunnels that are infoldings of this sarcolemma. The tunnels are called T tubules. And so muscle cells have T tubules. And T tubules are transverse tubules. They're like this. The membrane is folded in like this. And so when we get an action potential, the action potential does this. And when it gets to the T tubule, it just does this. It keeps right on going, and now it goes down into the cell, and then right back up. So the action potential isn't just on the surface like it is in a neuron. The action potential is deep inside the muscle cell. It conducts that action potential deep inside the muscle cell. So when we look at it, 
if we have this action potential, here it is, it's going to go like this. And when it gets to the T-tubule, the transverse tubule, it's going to go this way. And it's not just going to happen on this one. It's going to happen on every one of them. It's going to happen here. And it's going to happen here. And it's going to happen here. It's going to happen everywhere. And so the action potential is on the inside of the cell as well as on the outside of the cell. So our action potential goes all the way through the cell. Here's what those two action potentials look like. They look almost identical. There are a couple of differences. Here's the action potential on a neuron. Remember, we're going to start at about minus 70. That's our resting potential. When we reach threshold, which is about here, it's going to go up, and it's going to go up to about plus 30, and it's going to come down, and then all that. The thing lasts about two thousandths of a second, two milliseconds. If you look at it on a muscle cell, it's exactly the same, except we don't start out at minus 70. We start out down here at about minus 85, sometimes a little lower. And it's going to go up in there. It also has a threshold. And when we reach threshold, it's also going to go up to plus 30. And it's also going to come back down. But instead of taking two milliseconds, it takes about five milliseconds. Also, remember when we talked about the neuron, we talked about ions. So on this side, sodium is coming in. And on this side, potassium's going out. It's exactly the same over here. Sodium comes in. And potassium goes out. Exactly the same. We also, exactly the same, have the same channels, the same pumps, everything. It's not much different at all. So the action potential that's on the sarcolemma looks very similar to that on a neuron. But again, instead of it being 2, it's 5. Instead of being minus 70, it's about minus 85. Those are the big differences. And then don't forget, our sarcolemma folds in like this, and so the action potential is going to go down deep into the cell as well as be on the surface. Well, look. Here is one of those myofibrils. Remember, there are hundreds of these in there. And look what happens here. This is our T-tubule right here. It makes a circle around the myofibril. And so every single myofibril, we go back to this picture, has a T-tubule come in and around it like that. A T-tubule come in and around it like that. Every single one of them. And so these T-tubules run through the cell. And so they look like this. And so it's sort of a network in here running because every one of these has a T-tubule around it. And so the action potential it's not just here, it's also all in here. Throughout this cell, there's an action potential in there with the myofibrils. Any questions? Okay, here's a view of a model that you're going to see. This is a model we use in the lab, and if you take, do the lab part of this, this is the model you'll see for it, too. So right here, that's our sarcolemma. And look, there's those little holes that we saw. That's the opening to the T-tubules. And these blue things are the T-tubules. And look how they wrap around every one of these myofibrils. And so the action potential isn't just out here. 
It's also here and here and here and here and in there, all around in here. Every single one of these is where the action potential is. So it, again, it's not just on the surface. It's throughout the cell. Here's another view of it. So here's our action potential right here. And again, that action potential, when it gets to the T2 view, it's going to go this way and all the way down and then back up. And then it just keeps going. And it happens on every one of these T2 views. Okay. Well, we also have inside the muscle cell Beside the T tubules, right next to it, and you can see it in this picture, is something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is actually a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. That's what it is. So if you remember that from general biology, it doesn't have any ribosomes on it. It's a network of, of membranes. They also surround every single myofibril. So if we go back to our model, that's what this is right here. This is this sarcasmic reticulum. And look, you can see it's surrounding it all the way around. And if you look at the ends of it, the ends of it are enlarged. So there's an end and there's an end. And that end has a name, it's called the terminal cisterna. So it's like the root, the word cistern. So if you know anything about Texas or anywhere else where it's dry, people have cisterns and they collect rainwater and store the rainwater in this cistern. And so it's a storage place. And so we're going to store something in here. We're going to store something there. And what gets stored in here is calcium. And so all in here is little calcium ions. It's just full of calcium. Full of calcium. And so... We have these terminal cisterni. Remember, this wraps around everyone. And look, the cisterna bumps up against the T tubule. So there's a T tubule here. There's our T tubule. And then here's one of those cisterns. And here's another one. And look, it's three things right next to each other. Three things. And so sometimes that's called a triad. So a triad is two of these cisterns and one T tubule. So here's another triad right here. If we look on the model, if we go back, you can still see the triad right here. So here's a triad and here's a triad and here's one. Any questions? Well, like I said, the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. And so the calcium is in here, but it has to get in here some way. And so there are little pumps, just like our sodium potassium pump, but this is a calcium pump. And the calcium pump, just like the other one, takes calcium from out here and brings it inside. And so these pumps are all along here, all along. And so they pull the calcium out of here and put it in here for storage. And so calcium gets moved in here by these calcium pumps. There's also, though, a way for the calcium to get out. So the pumps bring it in, but there are channels which let it out. So not only are there pumps on the here, there are also channels all along here. 
and these are voltage gated calcium channels. So remember voltage gated are open because of a change in electricity. And so there are all these little channels here all along. Well think about this, what is an action potential? It's a change in electricity. Remember we go from minus 70 up to plus 30. And so what happens when these action potential comes along here, all these little channels are going to open and calcium is going to come pouring out. And so that calcium is going to do something. We'll talk about it in a minute. And then when the action potential ends, those channels are going to close and then the pumps, which are all along here too, the pumps are going to turn around and pull the calcium back into this sarcoplasmic reticulum. So look at this. This is at rest. That means there's no action potential. Here's our pump right here. And here's a pump and so on. And look what it does. It takes calcium from out here and brings it in. Remember, it's a pump, so it uses ATP for energy. And so calcium is going to wind up in here. And there's going to be a lot of calcium in here because that's, we keep pumping it in here. And so it's going to be full of calcium. But look, there's also these channels right here. These are those channels, voltage-gated calcium channels. And what's going to happen when the action potential comes is those channels are going to open. So look, here's our pump. And what it does is it pumps calcium. Takes calcium here, pumps it in there. Takes calcium. And then here's the channels. And remember, they're voltage-gated calcium channels. Right now, they're closed. But when we get an action potential, that action potential is going to cause them to open. Now, this is a GIF. And if you watch this on the PowerPoints, you'll get to see the pumps working, and you'll get to see the channels opening and closing. I wish you could do that here, but it doesn't do that. But anyway. So as soon as an action potential happens, the action potential is going to go down here. And what's going to happen is all of these little channels are going to open. And the calcium is going to come pouring out. So that calcium is going to come pouring out. And it's going to pour out everywhere that there are these little channels. And it's going to wind up out here. And then when the action potential is over, then our pumps are going to take over and pull the calcium back in. Pull the calcium back in. Any questions? We'll see all this more later on. But look, here's our cell. So that's our muscle fiber. There's our sarcolemma right there. Here are the little openings to the T tubules right there. And these yellow things are all those T tubules. The blue things are the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And remember, they're wrapped around the myofibril. Any questions? So look, here comes our action potential. And you can see it. One action potential is going to create another action potential. It's going to create another one and so on. We're going to get continuous product, uh, conduction because there's not any myelin on muscle cells. So it's continuous conduction, which means every little part of the membrane is going to go through an action potential. The same thing all the way down here. We're going to get an action potential. And look, when it passes by these channels, the channels are going to open. And as soon as that happens, the calcium is going to come pouring out. So all of this calcium 
comes pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, and it winds up in here. Same thing here. And then the action potential is going to end. And remember what's going to happen? We're going to take all of that calcium and pump it back in. Our little pumps are going to go pump it back in. And it's going to wind up back the way it was before. Like this. So at rest, during an action potential, can everybody see what's going on here? So this is a nice summary slide, a nice place to come to look at what's happening. Because you can see what happens here at rest, and you can see what happens here during the action potential. And then it goes right back to this again. So when you look at this, there are these arrows in both directions. It just depends on we, do we have an action potential? Or has the action potential ended? So all that calcium is going to come pouring out. And it's this calcium that's going to produce or trigger muscle contraction. Any questions? For some reason my mouse has quit working. Here we go. Okay, so again, here's that model, and hopefully you can pick out all these things. Now this is a nerve. That's the nerve, the neuron, that's going to tell this muscle to contract. So this is a somatic efferent neuron. And right here is our, our synapse right here between the muscle and the, the, the neuron. And then, of course, this, the rest of this is the muscle fiber. So there's our sarcolemma. There's our T tubules. Here's our sarcoplasmic reticulum. These are the myofibrils. Hopefully you can pick out all that stuff. Any questions? Okay, let's talk about these myofibrils. So again, myo means muscle, and fibril means little fiber. So it's not the muscle fiber, it's the little fiber. It's the one inside the muscle fiber. And so what they are, remember, they're not cells. They're these little rod-like structures that produce a contraction, and they're packed in there like crazy. They make up almost all of the muscle volume. And when you look at a myofibril, they're striped. They're striped. We have light and dark, light and dark. And you can see this light and dark on the myofibrils. So when we look at it, look here and you can see it here. So here's dark and here's light. Here's dark and here's light. And so every single myofibril, look at them, they all line up with each other. Dark, light, dark, every one of them. And so because of that, we can see these stripes. So the stripes that we see on a muscle cell are not due to the muscle membrane. They're not due to the sarcolemma. They're due to these myofibrils. If we blow them up, it looks like this. So if we take that and blow it up, look, dark, light, dark, light. And again, they're all parallel to each other. Because they're all lined up, what we see when we look at this cell, we see these light and dark areas. Well, when you look at a myofibril, you can divide them up into small units called sarcomeres. So a sarcomere is the smallest unit of muscle that can contract. 
When we look at a sarcomere, we can see it here. They are separated or they have their ends as Z lines because they're called Z because they zigzag. So look, it zigzags here. And here's another one that zigzags. So between two Z lines is one sarcomere. And so look, the sarcomeres are in, lined up end to end to end. So there's a sarcomere. So here's one, here's one, here's one. There's another T, a Z line, so there's one. There's another Z line, so there's one. There's another Z line. And so they're lined up end to end to end like this. And if you look at the sarcomere, you can see light areas and dark areas. Light areas and dark areas. So if we blow it up even more, here's what we see. The dark, sorry, the Z line is easy to see. And so again, that's where the ends of the sarcomere are. So there's one Z line and there's one Z line. Well, the area around the Z line is light colored. So this light colored area, which goes from here to here, is called an I band. So here's another I band right here. And here's another I band right here. And here's another one and so on. It's the lighter colored area. And then the darker colored area, which is this, is called an A band. So that's an A band. So we have I bands and A bands. So here's another A band right here. And here's another A band. And here's another one. So we have I bands, light colored, A bands, dark colored. And then if you look in the center of the A band, Look, there's a little bit lighter colored area right here. You can see another one over here, the right here, this little bit lighter colored area right in the middle of the A band. That is called the H zone. And if you look in the very center of the H zone right here, we're gonna see another line but it doesn't wiggle. Looks like a straight line right here, right here. That's called the M line. Now, sometimes it might be M band, but M line. And so when we look at this, we have all these different things. Our A band is the darker area. Our I band is the lighter area. The Z line, remember, is what's going to differentiate between sarcomeres. Our I band surrounds the Z line. In the middle of the A band is an area called the H zone. And in the very center is the M line. So hopefully you can pick out these things. If we blow it up a little bit more, you can see it looks like this. So there's our Z line right there. And here's another Z line right here. So that's one sarcomere. And if you look on a real picture, this is the Z line right here. And this is the Z line. So that's one sarcomere. And then the area around the I band is the lighter, or sorry, around the Z line is the lighter colored area. That's the I band. And in the middle, we have a darker area. That's this, that's the A band. And in the center of the A band, a little bit lighter colored area. That is the H zone. And then in the very, very center is the M line. Any questions? So look, it's not, we didn't make it up. This is what it really looks like. If we blow it up even more like this. So see if you can pick out these different parts.
So here's a slide, and you can see lots of these myofibrils. So this is one myofibril. This is another myofibril. This is another myofibril. So this is inside a single muscle cell. And if you look right here, what this stuff is, those are uh, the T tubules. That's the T tubule right there and right there. These are the T tubules. And then if you look at all this stuff, that is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then we can go and look at a sarcomere. Here's one sarcomere right here. And so there's our Z line. There's our Z line. Here's our I band, I band. Here's our A band, H zone, M line. Can everybody pick all that out? Anybody have any questions? You blow it up and then compare it to a drawing. You can see what it looks like. Well, what's going to happen when a muscle cell contracts is these these I bands and A bands are going to slide past each other. So look at this one. This one is relaxed. In other words, not contracted. Look how far apart the Z lines are. And look how big, how wide the I band is. And then look at the H zone. It's this wide. There's our M line right there. But look what happens when it contracts. This is going to slide this way, and this is going to slide this way. And now look at the distance between the Z lines. Look how small the I band is now. And look, that H zone disappears. It goes away. We can't even see it anymore. You'll see the M line right there. So what happens is a sliding filament mechanism. The thin filaments, or sorry, the, the I bands and the A bands are going to slide past each other. Well, let's look inside a sarcomere. So when we look inside a sarcomere, what we're going to see are even smaller muscle fibers. They're even smaller, so now they're called filaments. So we're going to see myofilaments. And there are two types of these. There's the thin filament and the thick filament. And you can see them here. This is the thin filament right here, the blue one. And this is the thick filament right here, the red one. And remember what's going to happen is these are going to slide in. The, the I band is going to slide in. Well, it's these filaments that is making this happen. So the thick and thin filaments slide past each other during a contraction. So if we go back to this picture. What we're seeing is the thin filament here. There it is, the green one. And the thick filament here, which is the blue one. Look, they slide past each other. The thin ones slide in from both directions. And so again, this is called the sliding filament mechanism. Well, you can picture that happening here. And here the blue ones are the thin and the red ones are the thick and they're going to slide past each other. Same thing here. The blue ones are the thin, the red ones are the thick and they're going to slide past each other. And as this slides and this slides, these Z lines are going to get closer and closer together. And our H zone, which is right here, is going to disappear because the thin filaments are going to slide in there. So we can see these thick and thin filaments. So again, 
Here, these pink ones are the thin, and these purple ones are the thick. Well, when we look at a picture like this, we get the idea that this is flat, like, like a piece of paper. It's two-dimensional, but that's not true. Remember, it looks like this. They're rod-like. And so if we were to cut across here anywhere, we should be able to see thick and thin because we would see it like this. And so let's do that. If we make sections across this myofiber, we're going to see these filaments. And depending on where you cut, you're going to see thin or thick or both. So look, if I were to cut right there, I would only see thin filaments. If I were to cut right there, I would only see thick filaments. And so let's look at it. Let's look at the Z line first. So here's our Z line. There's another one. And if you slice across the Z line, it looks like this. So look at all this cross hatching in here. And this cross hatching makes this very, very stable. This is an anchoring point. And it's an anchor for the thin filaments. So when we look in there, all we see are these thin filaments. And then we see these little cross hatching that hold them together, that anchor them and make them more stable. Same thing's true for the M line. If we look across the M line, the M line, you're only going to see thick filaments. But again, what we have here, this is an anchor, anchor for the thick filaments. And again, we're going to see a lot of cross hatching here, and that cross hatching is going to make this stable and strong. But if we look in places where it's not the Z line or the M line, we're going to see other things. So let's look right here. This is the I band. And if we look in the I band, it's going to look like this. So we're not going to see any thick filaments. We're only going to see thin. Now, these little green things are called Titan. And they're in there, but Titan has nothing to do with the contraction. It just helps stabilize the thick filaments. So you can see them in there, but we're not going to talk about them very much because they don't really do anything except keep the thick filaments in place. But look, you got all these thin filaments. If we look in the H zone, that's right here. Look, this is what it looks like. There's the H zone. And these thick filaments are purple, but see the little green dot? That's that Titan. And so what Titan is going to do is it's going to hold these things in place. So when you look at them, they look like this. They run to the end of the thick filament. They run to the end of the thick filament. They attach to the Z line as well. You can see them over here. There's Titan. So again, they're just there to keep um, the thick filaments in place. But look. Just thick filaments. But look at this part right here. So if we look here, look, those thin and thick filaments overlap each other. And if you look at that, it looks like this. Well, you might think it's random, but it's not. Remember, there's our Z line, there's our I band, there's our M line, there's our H zone, and here's this zone of overlap. Let's blow this up and look at it. When you blow it up and look at it, look, these things are not in here randomly. You can pick any thick filament that you want to, 
and then count how many thins are around it, and it's exactly the same number every time. Six. Each thick is surrounded by six thins. And then on the inside, at least, if you pick any thin filament, we can pick this one. Look, it has three thicks around it. Pick another one, this one. It has three thicks around it. So this pattern is very, very precise. Each thick is surrounded by six thins, and each thin is surrounded by three thicks. And then if we look at what's in the I band and the A band and the H zone, we can already tell. If we look at the I band, here's the I band. We only have thin. There are no thicks in there, just thin. If we look in the H zone, we only have thick. There's no thick thins in there, just thick. But if we look here, we're going to have both thick and thin. So when we look at a slide under a microscope now, these stripes mean something. So even though they're hard to see because it's so small, I can see this light area right here, and that's an I band. I can see this dark area right here, and that's an A band. If I look in the center of the eye, I can see this faint Z line. And if I look in the center of the A, I can see this faint H zone. Now you really can't see M lines in this picture, but they're there too. Remember we have these thick filaments and thin filaments. <laughs> so we're going to look at these individually. Thick and thin filaments. And so when you look at them, they're made of proteins. So let's look at thick filaments first. <coughs> thick filaments are made out of one protein, a single protein, and it's called myosin. So myosin actually comes in two forms, though. It has a head, which looks like this, and that's heavy myosin. And then it has tails like this, but these tails, one from each head, are intertwined like this. And so that's light myosin. So we have heavy and we have light. If we look at it, it looks like this. So here's heavy and here's light. Well, if you look at the heads and the tails, they look a little bit like balloons on a string. So here's a balloon, and here's a balloon, and here's the string, but it's two strings that are twisted together like this. So it looks like that right now. Well, right where they come together is a special little region, which is called the hinge, or sometimes called the neck. So there's the hinge right there the neck, and this hinge, this neck, acts like a spring. Think about a spring. You know, a spring looks like this. You probably played with one at some point in your life. And you can bend a spring. You can make it like this. Well, when you bend it, it takes some energy to bend it. You have to use it. It's a little bit of effort. And when you bend it, you store energy in it. You store energy in that spring. And that's exactly what happens here. It's bent like this. And here is the spring, and we store energy in that spring. Well, think about what would happen if you bend the spring like this, and then you let go of it. 
it's going to go boing and it's going to go back to this shape. And that's what's going to happen here because it's bent right here. And if I release the spring, it's going to go back to this position. And then if I want to make it back in the other position, I have to add energy to it. I have to use some work, some energy to make it go back to this position. And when I do, I store energy in it again. And then when I release it, it's going to fly this way. And then I'm going to have to use energy to make it go back this way. So think of it like a spring. So here it is, bent position. That word is said is cocked. So the head is cocked, like cocking the hammer on a gun. And then when we release this, the head is going to fly to this position, and that's the uncocked position. And if I want to put it back this way, I'm going to have to add energy to it. I'm going to have to do work to get it back in this other position. Well, that's just one myosin molecule. But you don't have just one. Look, you have hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And every single one of them looks like this. And every single one of these heads are already cocked. They're in the bent or cocked position. All of these. And so they're all in this position where the head is cocked and they're storing energy in the neck, in the hinge. Now, if you look at the heads, remember they look like balloons, sort of. So here's one, and here's another one. And then they have those tails. We already talked about that. And the neck, we talked about that. Well, these heads have binding sites on them. And there's two binding sites on each head. A binding site is where something can bind. And there's two on each head. And binding sites are named for what binds there. Well, what binds there, one of them is ATP. That's our energy source. And ATP binds right here and right here. But we also have another binding site called an actin binding site. Now, we don't know what actin is yet, but it's also a protein, and it has binding site right here. So all myosins, each myosin has these two binding sites. So if you look at it, there are the binding sites right there. So there's one for actin and one for ATP, one for actin and one for ATP. And there's our tail. There's our neck region right there. And remember, it's true for every one of these. They all look like this. They all have these two binding sites. Any questions about it? Let's look at the thin filament. So remember the thick filament was one protein. Thin filament is three proteins. One of them is actin. We just heard about that a second ago. There's one called troponin and one called tropomyosin. So let's look at actin first. So when you look at actin, actin looks like this. It looks like a little glob. In fact, it's called globular or G-actin. And it's got a binding site on it. This binding site is for myosin. So it's called the myosin binding site. But you don't just have one actin. There's a bunch of them like this. And they're connected to each other. 
They look a little bit like pearls on a string. But it's not a single strand of pearls. It's a double strand of pearls. And it's twisted. It's helical. So it looks like this. So here's an actin. Here's an actin. These are all actins like this. But it's this double strand. And it's twisted. So if we go back to this picture, that's what this is. So here is one actin. That's a g-actin. But this double strand of actin is called F-actin. stands for filamentous. So we have G-actin. Wrong direction. G-actin. That's one actin. And it has a binding site, a myosin binding site. But they're not one. There's a bunch of them. Many of them. And so that's called F-actin. And so F actin, remember, is this two strands that are helical shaped, two strands, and they're shaped like a helix. So they're shaped like this, or like this. Okay. We also, though, have another protein. This protein is called troponin. So troponin binds to G-actin. So here's our actin right here. Remember, every one of these has got a binding site, a myosin binding site. So here's all our binding sites right here. There's one, and there's one, and it binds myosin. And then troponin binds to this. Well, if you look at troponin, it has three subunits. It looks like this. And what it can do is it can change shape. And so it can go from a shape like this to a shape like this. And it can go back again to a shape like this. And what makes it change shape is calcium. It takes two molecules of calcium. It binds and it changes shape. But when the calcium comes off, it goes back to its original shape. And this troponin sets on top of myosin like this. So here's a troponin right here. And then we go one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's another one right here. And then we go one, two, three, four, five, six, and here's another one over here. So that's troponin. So again, Troponin can change shape, and it changes shape because of calcium. So it has a calcium binding site. And so here's where the calcium binds, right here. Here's where the calcium binds, right here. And so if we look at what it looks like, it looks like this. So look, see the three subunits? It's purple. It's got three subunits. And again, it looks like this. So you can see there's one big ball and two little balls. One big ball and two little balls. It looks like this. And it has this calcium binding site right there can see it. Two calciums bind. Two calciums. You can see it right there. And when the two calciums bind, remember, it changes shape. It goes to a shape like this. It tilts. And then there's one more protein. And that protein is troponin.
Where's my other picture? And that protein <clears throat> is tropomyosin. So tropomyosin, remember here's our actin, and here's our troponin. Right here's a troponin. Here's another troponin. And here's tropomycin. And what tropomycin does is it binds to the troponins like this. It's just a straight molecule. It's not very exciting. It looks like that. Or it looks like this. That's tropomycin right here. And so look, it connects troponins to each other. There it is right there. And then it connects this troponin to the next one and so on. But what it does is it lays on top of these binding sites. And so tropomyosin blocks the myosin binding sites. So this is what that looks like. So here's our actin. Here's our troponin, and here's our tropomyosin. Everybody picture how this is? And then what's going to happen is calcium is going to come along. So here comes calcium. It's going to bind in our calcium binding sites. And what that does is going to make this shape. And because it is attached to tropomyosin, it's going to pull tropomyosin. So it's going to change shape and it's going to pull tropomyosin. And what's going to happen when tropomyosin moves is the binding sites are going to become uncovered. And so it's going to look like this. So now here comes this calcium, it binds to troponin, troponin changes shape, it pulls tropomyosin, and tropomyosin slides off the binding sites. So now look, all these binding sites are open and available. If we take the calcium off, troponin is going to go back to its original shape. And when it goes back to its original shape, tropomyosin is going to slide back over the binding sites again. So now look, the binding sites are blocked. But if calcium comes along again, this is going to happen. And now they're available, they're open. But when the calcium is removed, this happens. And so this calcium is this trigger to allow the muscle to contract because it opens these binding sites or causes them to be open. Any questions? So Johannan says this is troponin is a cardiac marker. So what you, she's talking about is, remember this, we're talking about skeletal muscle, but cardiac muscle is exactly the same. So if we look at the um, sarcomere of cardiac muscle, it looks exact same. And so it has the same thin filaments and thick filaments just like this. So it looks just like this. Well, what happens when you damage this muscle is these fibers begin to break down. And when the fibers break down, the proteins are released and they wind up in the bloodstream. And one of those proteins is troponin. And so when someone has a heart attack, these fibers break down just like this. And these troponin is released into the bloodstream. And so if you measure troponin levels in the bloodstream, they go way up. That's because of this muscle damage. And so it's a good indicator that there's something causing muscle damage. And so we're going to see after a heart attack, 
muscle fibers are going to die. That's what happens to them. They're going to die. And all these proteins are going to break down and be released as they break down. And so, again, some of them are going to wind up in the bloodstream. And so troponin is one of those. And so troponin levels go up. And so if you go to the hospital and you think you've had a heart attack, they'll do an ECG to see what that looks like. And then they also measure troponin levels to see if there's been a heart attack in the past, a recent past. Does that tell you your answer, Johanan? Anybody else have a question? So let's get back to where we were, and we're almost done. So that's what our sarcomere looks like. And so again, this calcium is this trigger to make this happen. And when those binding sites open, that's when we're going to get a contraction. And so again, this is a GIF and you can watch it happen. But remember what happens is we're going to get an action potential and the action potential is going to open these channels and this calcium is going to come pouring out. Well, when the calcium comes pouring out, this is where it goes. It goes here. And as soon as it binds to the troponin, troponin is going to change shape and our tropomyosin is going to slide out of the way and open up the binding sites. Any questions about that? And then remember, this is where we're talking about. These are those little filaments in here. These tiny little things. This is where we're talking about, thickening filaments. And so you can imagine just how many of these there are in one myofibril and then in one muscle cell and then in one muscle. There are just billions of these things. And so when the calcium comes in here, Remember what's going to happen? Troponin is going to change shape. We're going to open up binding sites. And right here, where that happens, that's where we're going to get a contraction. And so the contraction happens at the sarcomere level, not at the cell level. It happens at the sarcomere. And remember, one sarcomere is the smallest unit of a muscle that can contract. Well, remember this is skeletal muscle, and skeletal muscle is voluntary. And so in order for skeletal muscle to contract, it must be told to contract. We choose. And so we're going to send an action potential. And so that action potential is going to start on a neuron. It's going to wind up on the muscle cell. It's going to go down the T-tubules right by those terminal cisterni, we're going to release calcium and that calcium is going to be the trigger for muscle contraction. So it doesn't start on the muscle, it's going to start with the central nervous system. It's going to start in the brain and the spinal cord and then we're going to send a signal down a static efferent neuron. We're going to release a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is going to bind to channels. We're going to get a graded potential. If it's big enough, it's going to turn into an action potential. So there's our action potential. And the action potential then is going to go down these T tubules. And so you can see it happening here. And as it goes down the T tubules, it's going to open the channels. The calcium is going to pour out. The calcium is then going to go to troponin. And this is another GIF, so you can actually watch it happen if you're doing this on the uh, PowerPoint. But look, when that calcium binds, there's calcium right there. When it binds, these are going to open. And what's going to happen is these thick and thin filaments are going to hook up in those binding sites. And then what's going to happen is the thin filaments are going to slide past the thick filaments. Our muscle sarcomere is going to get shorter. When sarcomeres get shorter, myofibrils get shorter. Here's another GIF. 
I wish this would let you see it, but you can't. But there's another GIF. So you're going to see this slide in and this slide in. And so this is going to pull. This is going to pull. And whatever it's attached to is going to move. And so there's rest. Look how wide this is here. Look how wide this is. And then here's a contraction. Look how narrow this is. And look how narrow this is. And that's because this slid that way and this slid that way. And if that happens at sarcomeres, here's a sarcomere, here's one, here's one, here's one. When it happens at all of them, the myofibril is going to get shorter. Any questions? So when we come back, for the next one, we'll talk about the mechanism of how this all happens. But even now, you should have some general idea of how a muscle contraction works. Well, that's as far as we're going to go today. Anybody have any questions?